Instead, my talk will be on language use and, um, and the applications to the classroom. So I'd just like to thank my uh, graduate program, linguistics program at BFMG. Uh, also to thank Lael, and I would like to say that BFMG is my academic home, but Lael is the place where I always felt at home. So <laughs> it's always great. And to be with you for so many years, um, I have interacted with uh, Tony and his colleagues, first with uh, the group that worked with uh, uh, teacher research, and, um, and then later um, my research started focusing more on corpus linguistics, and I have been working with Tony um, since then, since uh, 2009. So I'd like to thank our funding agencies in Brazil and Jelki Research Group, um, which uh, uh, Tony um, coordinates, and also my own research group. And we do research with uh, specialized corpora and learner corpora. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of uh, interaction and uh, some overlap with interesting, I think, uh, comments that we'll have in relation to Anna's presentation just now. Um, so the webinar plan is the following. I'll do an overview uh, of corporate language education first, and then um, talk a bit about the um, corpus linguistics contributions to the understanding of language use, such as phraseology, lexical grammar, register, and then talk more about this, the, uh, the focus of this um, webinar today, which is corporate for the language classroom, going through examples of using learner corpora, uh, internet resources, um, creating your own corpora, and we'll also be mentioning the differences between English for academic, gener general academic purposes, and English for specific academic purposes. And at the end, we hope that we always feel like it's always important to educate teachers. And uh, so um, this is something I won't be able to talk about today, but my group, research group has also worked on um, workshops and ways of educating language teachers to use corpus linguistics. And after all, all we want is to inspire our learners to learn more about language and to learn how to use real language, right? Well, so here we go. Um, so to start with, I want to show this um, graph here uh, that I took from Uta Homer's paper, 2010, in which she divides the um, pedagogical corpus applications into two blocks here. First, the indirect application ones, um, which is more used by researchers, materials writing, uh, writers, and the direct applications ones that are the hands-on when learners and teachers uh, use uh, corpus resources or corpus tools, right? So um, on both sides, as you can see, um, the materials writers and researchers can use general corpora or specialized corpora, and it's the same for the teachers and students. What it means on general corpora, you probably know, but um, if you're not from the area, it would be something like the British National Corpus, COCA, the Corpus of Academic, uh, Corpus of American uh, English, and um, which has a variety of registers, and it tries to um, portray the use of the language, English language, for instance, in general. In a specialized corpora would be, an example would be my case, which is Michigan uh, corpus of uh, students' writings, for instance, so something more specific. My, um, my own research group and what Anna Bocorni just presented to us is a special work also with a specialized corpora. So she presented the, her corpora in the medical area, and I'll mention, for instance, our corpus on um, chemistry, biology, and things like that. Anyway, okay. So let's talk more and more specifically about the indirect applications, which are quite important for the language uh, teaching area. 
So we will start with John Sinclair, right? So in the 80s, um, John Sinclair was um, uh, the coordinator of a huge in the project, uh, the Collins Could Build project. Um, and uh, they started with the Birmingham Corpus that at that time had 20 million words. It seems to be not too big for today's standards, but it sure was a big corpus, right? And they had, um, and, and later that became the bank, called the Bank of English, which is a subset of the calling corpus, right? Just um, in the calling corpus today um, can be accessed through the word banks online and it has 4.5 billion words, right? So you're now see how uh, with the advance of technology, bigger and bigger corpora became available. Um, and it's similar, the word banks is uh, just a bit smaller than uh, COCA, for instance, right, that we can access online. Um, well, in all the studies that they did, which was really corpus driven, getting from data, from the corpus information to um, prepare materials, right? And so there, the information they had came, uh, their corpus was made of uh, spoken and written materials from different native uh, speaker varieties, right? And above all, what was really important was that they had language use. That's what they were really interested to see language as authentic language and see how language worked. So all the um, information came from real language and they were able then to create a um, new generation of learner's dictionary, a very ground, uh, groundbreaking work and also um, generation of grammars, right? So this is a, so since the 80s, uh, this is, has been very important for language teaching, especially English language teaching. Um, so just one thing is that, um, so this is what Homer has called the indirect applications of corpus studies. And on the other side of the direct applications of corpus studies, we have the work of Tim Johns. So Johns was also from Birmingham and was very much influenced by Sinclair's work. And uh, on his, uh, his principles uh, put learners and teachers task um, as, impo as important, but putting, let's say, the learner as a very active a part of the learning process, right? To discover the foreign language and the teacher task was then to provide a context um, in which the learner can develop strategies for discovery, right? So the learner is then a linguistic researcher. And if corpus linguistics research is empirical, lear language learning should be too. So this is, um, very important in Tim Jones' work, right? So learners there, right here, um, looking for information uh, in many different ways on computers, on printed um, material. When he started, he always talked very much about that. Um, and so he created the approach uh, DDL, which is quite famous, and uh, which refers to data-driven learning. Right, so it comes from data for students to discover and find out about language. So students do get a very active um, part in the learning process. That's all we have always wanted. But in language teaching, sometimes in grammar teaching, um, there used to be a tradition of the teacher talking too much. And so in this uh, approach, that's um, not really the point, right? So let's think a little bit and see it here, some of the contributions of corpus linguistics to the understanding of language use. So what did corpus linguistics bring to the, uh, to the world of language studies that was new and that helped us um, also in the teaching uh, part, right? So here, 
well, then I'm getting to phraseology and that make, makes a good connection with uh, Anna's presentation just now, right? So uh, first of all, with the studies on collocation by Sinclair and uh, so uh, you could define collocation as a series of words that occur more often than would be expected by chance. So when we think of the word um, deal, right, in uh, and we look for uh, frequent words that go together with deal, then we can get a good deal, a big deal. And when we look at those two collocations, a good deal and a big deal, they are quite different in meaning. So the meaning is not uh, given by just one word, but by the surroundings uh, words, right? The collocates uh, that go with them. When you say no big deal, it's quite different from when you say a good deal in terms of a business or something, buying something, right? Um, and, and also the studies uh, that have contributed a lot to, um, to our understanding of language is also the studies on lexical bundles. Uh, which are simply uh, sequences of words, uh, forms that commonly go together in natural discourse, right? And um, all the studies that have been done that have showed variation across registers. And here are just some examples of lexical bundles. And if you saw Anna's presentation, then I don't have to go much into this because this was very well covered. Um, Okay, so besides studies on phraseology, corpus linguistics has done, has developed a lot of studies on lexical grammar. Um, and again, um, this is gonna connect with uh, Anna's presentation, right? Because grammar and lexis are closely related and should not be studied separately. What does that mean? It means that grammatical patterns and lexis seem to go together. So it seems that some words tend to occur more often in some grammatical patterns. So, or, or some lexes call for some grammatical patterns. So for instance, if you look at the word matter, if there is a verb that comes after it, um, then if you have a matter of, then this verb will come in the ing form. Uh, or um, sequences of words, exactly what, um, Anna was talking about uh, that Biber calls the lexical frames, um, we would see the internal, internal variation of this a pattern of in the something, which is a now and of, right? So we have in the light of, in the case of, in the course of, which are very common in academic uh, writing in some types uh, of, uh, of texts, right? Um, so then since uh, Sinclair's study, there's been a lot of a great interest in understanding this internal variation and understanding how that relates to the pattern, the grammatical pattern itself. So that's a uh, corpus linguistic contribution in lexical grammar. Um, also, one of the greatest contributions of a corpus linguistics is also our understanding of register, right, and the work of Biber. And um, here, then, the register is a variety associated with a particular situation of use, including particular communicative purposes. And in this way, um, it's really important to understand the situational context where that register is uh, used, right? If it's, uh, um, and the linguistic features that emerge from those registers, uh, they are pretty much determined by the context itself and especially by the relationship between the situational context and the linguistic features themselves, right? And um, it's also important to um, highlight that in the register studies, the core currents of the linguistic features um, really characterize uh, the register and they can be interpreted as dimensions of variations across registers. Um, and I'm not going to have the time to get into details of this, um, this in this area, but that's something I have been working with together with Tony and many other people in our group, um, in, in the group that he coordinates. And um, it has given us 
very interesting perspectives on language use and some of them can be um, taken to lang the language classroom. Right? So now getting to core prep for the language classroom. So here we're going to talk about English for general um, academic purposes, English for specific academic purposes, give examples of a learner, the use of a learner corpus, um, examples of uh, online corpus tools, and also um, example of uh, students on corpus used in the classroom here, and teachers too, but today mainly students making their own corpus. Okay. So, um, first of all, I want to talk about a series of tasks um, that we, um, I have uh, prepared with some of my uh, co-authors in, in which we focus on the academic register. And more specifically, I will report um, results from a study on essay, um, academic essays. And um, it was a uh, the, the results were published last year, and it comes from our uh, learner corpus, actually from our learner corpora. So these are some results in which we um, compared the use of linking adverbials, and this is just a part of our results here. We um, compared the use of um, these three linking adverbials, um, in CORIFA, which is a corpus of English for academic purposes, and the corpus of uh, um, language without borders, CORISP. Sorry, the names are in Portuguese here. <laughs> the corpus names, the corporate names are in Portuguese. And we compare the results with the Lochness. What, what does this mean? It means that we counted the frequency and then we um, did the statistics log likelihood to see if uh, they. Um, the frequency that was used by the students, um, non-native students, were um, as expected, above expectations or below expectations. So this plus here means that our students used a lot, much more than the native speakers from the Louvain corpus here of uh, essays, and therefore they used much fewer. Well, we won't have much time to get into details of that, but what I wanted you to see here um, is uh, that we started then uh, analyzing our um, the the texts themselves, and we noticed not only counting, but in um, quality. Um, trying to understand what were students doing, writing their piece of writing. And for instance, in this extract here, we see that there are two, um, two linking adverbials in, in a very short paragraph. And we, we noticed that um, sometimes there were a lot of linking adverbials in a very uh, a small paragraph or small text. And we wanted to understand more what was uh, going on there, right? Um, and then we did uh, a qualitative uh, part of this study, and uh, I'll show you some of the results in a minute. Uh, but what I wanted to show you here is um, some activities that we created to make students aware of how um, these linking adverbs are used, right? So we created um, language awareness activities based on the principles of uh, data-driven learning, right? Using internet resources to encourage investigation. Right? We want our students to be linguistic researchers, right? Um, and these activities can be done online or offline if uh, you could have it printed if you don't, if you think your access internet, yeah, access to the internet will fail in the middle of your class, which happens here sometimes. <laughs> So we can have that too. Well, anyway, uh, so here are some uh, concordance lines, just an example of things that we have shown our students and have asked them. And so these concordance lines have come from different registers. It's not only one register. Um, so conversation, academic, and so forth. And then we 
had a series of questions, exercise for students to find the patterns of use, the collocates that go together, and to think about the differences of use, the function of the linking adverbs, and, um, and also the differences across registers, right? And um, so you, by using the corpus of contemporary American English, which is available online, we can get uh, these charts that are uh, very good for learners to become aware of registers differences, right? Um, and see that, for instance, here that so is very much more frequent, more, much more frequent in spoken language and in academic. Of course, this count here for so includes other um, instances of so that are not linking adverbs. And this is also one step that we want learners to see the difference, right? When it's an intensifier or when it's a linking adverb. So that was, um, and then, so these concordance lines also taken from COCA, they, um, they came together with uh, some questions guiding the learners to discover patterns of language use in um, in this general uh, uh, in, in English in general for, uh, for academic purposes, not specific, right? Because here, what we have, Coca brings so many areas together: business, history, as we can see here, um, and we here ask the students well are these um, words so here when so is used are they in all of these instances all these um, sentences are they all linking adverbials or not what is their function their punctuation so there's a series of uh, questions in um, reflections that students uh, go through to become aware of uh, the difference right the in how it works more specifically in um, English for academic purposes. Well, another exercise we have uh, prepared and in, in we have had our students uh, do is to analyze uh, our learner um, corpora, right? So not only the, the texts that, that were written by Brazilian students here from Codifa and Codispi, but also comparing um, to extracts that were taken from the Luvan corpus. And again, the students had to read the sentences, identify the use, thinking about the meaning, the position of the linking adverbial, and so thinking about the discourse, how the, the discourse is being organized um, in that paper. Right like here, I'm just showing um, a few sentences, but uh, students had access to the whole essay um, if necessary. Well, so here are some examples. Well, and uh, what did we want uh, students to discover <laughs> that we discovered in our research? Um, especially, in here I'm just going to show you one of the things we had our students discover, was that in our learner corpus, um, so was really frequent in initial position, right? So we wanted to say, okay, then what does this mean, right? Uh, well, first, our research showed that they were much higher in our learner corpora than in Luvan. I already showed you that table. Um, and so we did um, a qualitative um, investigation to see all the functions that so in initial position fulfilled, right? And, um, and then here, what did we discover? In our research, we discovered that um, so in initial position many times is used to express um, how the writer got to a conclusion or for the writer to state an idea or to begin a topic rather than um, to show the idea of a result, right, of a consequence, which is much more common um, in the Luvan corpus. Um, and then uh, by looking at other studies, uh, we saw that um, these functions were much more frequent in conversation, right? Um, and from Zihan's study of 2016, um, for instance, there is an interesting uh, conclusion that uh, became 
it is in it is that so uh, is used to express the conclusion meaning um, and it occurred 15 times more in conversation than in written academic prose or written news, right? This study um, written in 2016 used the Wellington corpora of spoken in uh, written New Zealand English, and it's a very detailed uh, study on the use of uh, linking adverbials, and it found 21 functions of so across five different registers. So um, when we found those results in our learner corpora, and then we created the activities in, so students came, you know, we led the students to come to the same conclusions. Of course, we selected the samples as I showed you, for them to come to this conclusion and to show them that they probably needed to um, consider more this uh, use of so in initial position and be more careful with that because it was very characteristic of um, conversation rather than of more uh, academic proofs. Okay, so this is an example of uh, the work we have been uh, doing and the types of tests we have prepared based our, uh, on our results, first of all, from learner corpora. Now I'd like to show you um, another set of activities that we created um, to raise students' collocation awareness. And this is a paper that um, I wrote with two other colleagues, Almeida and Odfan, and it's in, in presses part of a, in a chapter of a book to be published by Tissot um, and edited by Van der Vianna. And um, why did we create, uh, decide to create these uh, series of activities um, on collocational awareness? Well, we, we started noticing, and that's also part of Almeida's 2014 study, um, noticing that our students in our learner corpus in, in her 2014 study was on uh, based on recall uh, that our students uh, use a lot of these common verbs very frequent verbs in English right for instance get give do take right so in even with other uh, in sentences that seem to be um, more into the academic context, right? Or when they were writing uh, for academic, uh, in an academic register, was supposed to be an academic register, they would use these verbs. So with get aims, give opportunity, rather than other uh, collocations here. So we created these activities to raise um, students' uh, awareness uh, of collocations in academic texts and to help students understand register adequacy concerning word choice. So I'll give you the example. So our paper, uh, the title of our paper, is there another choice? Because sometimes it's not that what students write is really wrong, so, but it sounds not, it's not wrong, but it doesn't sound as appropriate for that register. So what we worked with the students in, the, and I have uh, used many of these activities with uh, higher intermediate students in our college, <coughs> It's exactly to raise their awareness and to make them think about, well, can I write this in a way that it is more appropriate to the academic register, right? So we uh, start the activities exactly with the point that I made in the previous um, slides, showing students um, sentences in, in, in individually, they had to see if there were um, better choices for that. Um, <clears throat> students were also sorry, discussing groups um, the solutions that they would give to make that sentence sound more appropriate for an article or for an essay <clears throat> or for, uh, for instance, another genre that they write in our academic uh, course, writing, uh, writing uh, course is um, book reviews, right? And, um, and then they would have to analyze more sentences, um, propose other options, and there were class discussions. So there's a series of activities for them to 
get um, to this feeling, right, that there in, in the academic context there were other choices. Well, we did use um, this tool here, word and phrase, which is really interesting. I'll show you some sc screenshots um, from this. It's a free access, so students had to click here, right, um, go into this academic vocabulary list. So this is uh, a subset of COCA. So when students use this, um, this site, they do not have access to the whole COCA, but they have access to a part of it. And then they can put in the word here and choose the part of speech if you want technical. And there are many options that are quite interesting there. And for instance, here the students would put the uh, word that they, are, they want to learn more about, like the word achieve. And then they get all this information in different areas, how many, uh, uh, the frequency of the, the word as a verb, the, the noun collocates, and then there are um, concordance lines, uh, synonyms. So it's very rich and students can get a lot of uh, information. And so we, um, the series of tests that we did helped them learn to use this tool more appropriately. And so it's again the continuation here. No time to go into more details, but anyway. So at the at the uh, as part of their activities, they uh, we listed a series of verbs here on the left hand side: achieve, examine, perform, provide. And the students using those tools had to list then the collocates, right? The first highest collocate with achieve is goal. Then the second highest collocate with achieve is objective, and so forth. And they also had to extract sentences from um, the tool, right? Just giving examples um, of uh, how these collocations were used in context. Okay, so <clears throat> now um, I want to get into um, just a second here. So all of these two activities that I showed you, we were talking about English for academic purposes in a very general way. So I did not mention anything about uh, students from engineering, from history, from business. They, we treat them as, you know, as, uh, we treat the information as if there was <laughs> or they, there is a general academic English. And we know that there is a lot of uh, disciplinary variation. So one part of uh, EAP um, focuses on disciplinary variation and it's a very important part of the area. And so here I get a quote from Highland. Matty says that EAP, English for Academic Purposes, is most successful when it is tailored to meet the needs of the specific circumstances of students. And we do agree with that, although we think that for certain things, uh, we can deal with uh, academic purpose in a general way, but uh, it's also very important to deal with the spec specificities of uh, different areas. And I'm going to show you some examples of what we have done going from English uh, for general academic purposes to English for specific academic purposes. So here at the uh, Federal University of Minas Gerais, we have prepared in uh, uh, given courses on abstract writing and uh, writing of uh, scientific articles to chemistry graduate students. Uh, and this is, <laughs> this is uh, just a screenshot of our Google Classroom. Um, when we had a course offered um, of how to write scientific articles and it's written in Portuguese because this was the um, title of the course and students actually uh, received uh, credits for taking that course that was offered uh, through the chemistry graduate program by myself and some of my uh, PhD students. Okay, so here are some, so some some aspects of our um, course on writing scientific articles. So first, we had to make 
a lot of decisions, right? Uh, and our course decisions were, again, based on the studies on uh, English for academic purposes, on the studies uh, by, uh, on Jernra, by Sveils, right, and his associates, on Register, by Biber and his associates and others, and also on data-driven learning. And I'm not going to be able to talk about the whole course, of course, but I want to highlight the points and the moments that we used uh, corporate tools, right? So we did not use online corpora such as COCA, BMC, right, for some activities. Uh, we also used a subcorpus from our research corpus, um, the corpus of academic, uh, corpus of articles in chemistry. And that's Coraquim, and Coraquim is the, the title in Portuguese, and that's the work I did with Tony in the, while I was doing research at Lyell in 2018. Um, we compiled that corpus, um, and we have been working on uh, multidimensional analysis um, for a while on that. And we also compared, we had the students compare, and we did some uh, DDL tasks um, for the students to compare the corpus of uh, articles in chemistry uh, to the corpus of articles in applied linguistics and biology. And you probably would say, why, if they are chemistry students, right? But um, they find it's very interesting to contrast, right, to see that different areas um, work differently when they write. And so although they were from chemistry and, and it was a very specialized group, they enjoyed a lot seeing how different areas use uh, different moves or different, not only vocabulary, right, but really understanding how uh, the language is used. Because vocabulary, you all know there is specific vocabulary, right? And, but we go farther. We'll I'll show you some examples. And we also had the students create their own corpora. I'll show you that too in a minute. Okay, so this is um, an example of an activity we created um, based on Cort uh, Cortes 2013, uh, which is the beginning of the activity, students had to identify introduction features from different disciplines. Um, and uh, Anna also mentioned this article by Viviana Cortez, and then students also had to look for citation patterns. That's a lot, uh, some work of a sway of two, and they had to identify the use of verb tense and aspect. And of course, this is just part of the first page of the uh, activity they had to do, and there were introductions taken from um, the three areas. And they really enjoyed it because they could find um, some interesting differences. Okay, and let's see, the next activity uh, was the students learned how to use Anticonc, right, which is freely available and also um, um, so students learned how to use it. Why? Why? Because we wanted our students to um, use our research corpus, right? We actually created a subset, as I mentioned before, of uh, the corpus of articles in chemistry, and uh, we made that available to students so that they could do some activities uh, in class, in class and at home. Um, and by the way, just as a curiosity, um, our corpora, they were selected from um, journal articles of high impact. That was something also uh, Vivi, um, Anna mentioned in her previous talk. So ours was from, our corpus uh, has articles that come from high impact journals. And then students had learned to do, to use all the tools, like learned how to use word list, learned how to use collocate, clusters, right? So they had several activities. This is just an, an example of some things that they and they had to, to do, and we did step by step because we wanted them to experience that in class so that we would, as a way of encouraging them to use that on their own at home or whenever they were writing, right? And they're always, since they were all masters and PhD students, um, they already write in English. That's, a, uh, that's common in their group. <clears throat> Okay, so then the third aspect here was to have them build their own 
uh, corpus, right? So there are a series of tasks that they had to do and, and to get and prepare their corpus. So we told them to choose one journal in their research field. Well, our chemistry corpus um, covers different areas, right? And chemistry has many sub areas in organic chemistry, organic chemistry, um, computer chemistry, you know, computational chemistry, whatever. And so our corpus does not cover all of them. It covers the major areas, environmental chemistry. And anyway, so we wanted them to create their own corpus with a, a, a journal that was uh, more that they accessed often, their research group used, right? And they had to get five to 10 most viewed research articles in a period of time. They could choose if it was in that year, which was 2018 or the previous year, they had to, you know, we told them, okay, you have to stick to some parameters, just as we do when we um, pre compile our own uh, research corpus. And then step two, they learned how to do the whole thing, right? Using Notepad uh, and all the information that they had to keep. And I'm not going to go over all this because I'm going to run out of time. And then we get to step five. <laughs> and in step five, they were then, they had the corpus and they could share it with us, the teachers and the whole class, right? And then we told them, now you can use your corpus on Anticon and find out how researchers in your research field write, right? So this whole thing of, uh, for them to become aware of how the, this community of practice uh, writes, uh, uses English, right? And, um, I think I'm almost running out of time, so that I'm almost done here. And I just want to show you um, an example of uh, what the students did. So we asked them to write the article sections, section by section. So first week they turned in a sec, an uh, introduction section, then research the methodology, then research and discussion and conclusion. And so we gave them feedback and they edited using their corpora or any other online tool. So this was a result and discussion second draft and this is the beginning of the result and discussion that one of the students submitted. We used Google Drive and we were able to give them comments, right? And here is a conclusion that was written by one of the students and some of my comments can be seen here on the right hand side and that was a very interesting one because when i read this conclusion i said oh my god this is so short right so my comment was no yeah, this is quite too short right so compare why don't you compare the results the previous studies why don't you point out the limitations but then i said well maybe in his air his sub area that's the way they do it and then i will please check how detailed or not the conclusions are in your own article corpus, right? And so, and then I talked to him, we had a conference, and then he said, well, but, you know, this article is what we call short communications. And, and I was familiar with this type um, of publication, and I said, oh, okay, so then the, the, the article, although, although it was a full article, it was much shorter than others. And we gave them comments on moves, and we cannot see the whole, um, all the pages here, but there were comments on moves and comments on meaning and comments on language. Um, and then they had, they, they, they submitted um, several um, drafts. Okay, so here I'm coming to the end, and I would like to quote Randy Rapind and her one of uh, her great books on the use of corpora for the language classroom. So she wrote this. My interest in corpus linguistics as a vehicle to better understand language has blossomed. And with that, a keen interest in how to use corpus linguistics to make me a more effective language teacher and teacher trainer. So corpus linguistics allows teachers and learners to be confident that they are learning the language they will encounter when they step outside the language classroom and into the real world of language use, right? And I think that really, I was going to paraphrase it, but Randy's words were perfect uh, and fit really well here. And that's um, the last message I want to, to give you. And well, 
And these are some great books. Uh, of course, wouldn't uh, have to mention the Longman Grammar. That's a, a vast study of the language, of the English language, a great source for us, uh, researchers and teachers, and other great books, Randy's books that I mentioned, and other great books um, that make the connection between corpus linguistics and language teaching. And these are my references. And thank you very much. I guess we have a few, uh, time, a few minutes for questions, yes. right, Tony? <clears throat> I like the pomegranates. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yes, Hello. this is beautiful. This was from <laughs> a Lyle um, website, yeah. right? So I. All right, yes. I, Yes, I loved it. So I don't know, I, I would have probably to say thank you to the one who took this picture and probably have to, <laughs> to give, you know, the credits here. Let me know uh -huh. who took this beautiful picture later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you do have some questions, Daisy. Okay. And we have some time. All right, so let's see. Thank you. Could you please let us know once the paper and lexical bundles? Now? Okay, I think this is still about Anna's. So let's see. Uh, right, let's see if I see. Uh, so I think it's only the first one that is from uh, Anna's presentation. So all the other ones okay. are for you, I think. All right. Uh, so the first one, okay, did the students engage well with tasks like analyzing corpora? Uh, were they generating graphs like COCA, uh, one you showed? Well, um, the students did engage well analyzing corpora, but I have to tell you that in the beginning, we have to write to, to guide them and ask the right questions because students can get quite lost when they go to COCA, which is so big with so many concordance lines. So it's very important that they have an objective, that they go look for something and that they learn how to use the different tools, right? Um, so we did a series of activities that um, we asked them to do um, and also when we when we were giving them feedback on their own writings sometimes we would say okay ah go to the to your own corpus and check this or go to Kodakin to check that and then we would say okay you know this is a it has to do with the the use of the word so we gave them some tips because otherwise they get lost uh, they did not generate graphs i don't know if you um on their own they um, they use the tools right from either from Coca if they were accessing online corpus or their own corpus with the anti conch they didn't do anything else that was more sophisticated. Um, can we work with the corpus linguistics for elementary level? Oh, okay. Thank you for this question. So, how can we assist them identify recurring parents of language use with so little command of language? Yes, that's a very <laughs> Good question, and, and that's a very, um, very challenging. So one of my students, one of my master's students some years ago, she worked with um, sixth graders, if I'm not mistaken, um, sixth graders or seventh graders, and she did a very nice study um, on and helped them to um, discover some patterns that she noticed that they kept making mistakes with. But first of all, she, um, she had some genres that she was working with, right? So she was, she was working with um, biographies, short biographies and um, jokes. So she compiled a small corpus of autobiographies in English of short, not auto, but biographies. And also um, uh, um, a, a corpus of jokes, right? Because kids like that. And then, so she had that as a source of information. And then uh, she let the students uh, produce a biography and with a series of activities, of course, and then produce jokes, right? Written jokes to publish in the school newspaper, things like that. And then she used some of their, then she, she had her own classroom corpus of her, 
small learner corpus and the two other uh, corpora, uh, corpora, right? The biography and uh, jokes. And then she selected, she didn't have a computer um, lab for her students. And it was a public school. Um, well, some public schools do have computer labs, but her school did not have that at that time. And so she did the printing. She would select the, the concordance lines and then she had step-by-step -step, like a DDL tasks asking students to discover this and that and then and, and then they, they learned a lot of how to use prepositions, finding collocates, especially with some verbs and prepositions was one of her focus that I remember. It's, it is, uh, um, it's possible to do it. It uh, requires um, a lot from the teacher, but any preparing any good activity requires, you know, some time. And once you have the skill, because the teacher has to be skilled in using the tools, then you can prepare uh, the activity for the students to do it. And in that case, they did not have the the computers, but they they were able to analyze the concordance lines that were selected, and that's. It's also part of data-driven learning that the, the, the teacher selects uh, content, try right, to be analyzed, either concordance lines or uh, context. So this is part of it. Hope I have answered your question. Let's see. In the tasks for raising language awareness, was it a challenge to have the learners acquainted with corpus linguistics theoretical basis? Yeah. Well, so we try not to be too heavy on that, right, on the theoretical base. Um, because um, if, okay, let me put it in another way. It all depends on the students you have, right? If you were working with language students, people who are going to be language teachers or who are going to graduate as ling linguists, um, then uh, this can be also part of the, the work. But with the work we did with um, chemistry students, we were very light on that. We showed them what is a corp, what a corpus is. We showed, you know, a YouTube um, TED presentation with importance of uh, compiling corpus, but things that were short, interesting, and so to get them into it. And to tell you the truth, chemistry students love that, you know. A hard science students love numbers, so we had no problems with that. Sometimes our own students are more freaked out with that than students from other areas. But we did not get too much to the theoretical. But like when I work with my English students, then we discuss more about the basis for collocations and what it means um, to talk about lexical bundles, then we go more into that. Uh, in your opinion, what's the greatest contribution of corpus linguistics to the teaching and learning? Okay, well, <laughs> it's a <laughs> teaching and learning of English for general um, academic purpose or specific academic purpose. Well, it's really hard to say what is the greatest contribution, but I think, you know, uh, that all the notions, uh, the notions that I picked up, like the contribution in the understanding of phraseology, of lexical grammar, of register, I think they're all very important because it, it, it changed from um, the way people look at language. And I still think that this is not pervasive in language teaching, um, but people that um, have contact with corpus linguistics or have been educated uh, with materials that come uh, are based on uh, on corpus studies they do have a, another view of language right a lang language that comes from language use um, and that the importance that there is not a separation between uh, lex and grammar and you know not the over because for a long time language teaching uh, over emphasized syntax right and i think that's that's a problem <laughs> um and i think that's the greatest thing it's like to downgrade it's not that syntax is not important that's not the point but if it comes together with language use that's what matters for uh, language learning, right? And I think for EAP uh, as well, and I think EAP has um, more easily got this um, information in, um, and used more 
uh, corpus linguistics data than other areas of language teaching. Okay, which is the section of research article that poses more challenges for students? Why do you think so? Okay, that's a, a question we also want to answer and we are not sure yet, <laughs> but I think um, it seems that results and discussions is more open um, and it seems to be more difficult, but I cannot tell you for sure. Um, this is something we need to work more on. And uh, one of my um, co-authors wants to um, work on that and then develop some activities that we can test and have students uh, improve their writing. Uh, we have more questions, but uh, it's almost seven o'clock. Tony, what yes. do you say? <laughs> yes, I. It's it's there. There's so many questions still, and you 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 know you. You can, you can take those questions home and have a look at them and you know, if sure. you want you can reply to the to the audience and uh, but um, right now all I can do is thank you both tremendously mm -hmm. and thank the audience as well you've been great uh, thank you so much for coming by sticking till the end and um, so if if Anna and Daisy, if you want to share your slides, we've mm -hmm. had requests from the audience. So you can pass them on to me and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll share them through our, our website. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been lovely seeing you all. Uh, mark your calendars, everyone. So next Tuesday, the 12th of May, we're gonna have one uh, webinar by Carolina Zupardi, and she will talk mm -hmm. about collocations. So okay. everyone here is interested in collocations. So <laughs> mark your calendars. Uh, mm -hmm. So go to our our YouTube channel to see the previous talks, uh, the video videos for the previous talks. Let me just show you real quick here some of those what they look like. Um, So I hope you can see this. Mm -hmm. So here's our, you, you can follow the, the talks live here on our Facebook page, or you can go to our, our YouTube channel and go and watch or download all the presentations. And you can keep track of our talks, future talks and previous talks all here. You can check our, registrant maps it's really nice to see where everyone is coming from so for today we had this map uh, that with people spreading all across the world down here so it's really wonderful thank you all for stopping by yes and thank you check our oh, check your email you for your nice. certificates okay yes <laughs> Daisy, uh, send me a message i'll you. send